Okay, here's another experiment uh, that was done uh, uh, based uh, on um, exposing individuals uh, to new types of uh, experience that change their aspirations and help create new mental models. And uh, in a way, it, it really does suggest, uh, I hope, uh, uh, interesting new policy instruments that can be used in development. Um, one uh, has to do with uh, uh, experiment in India that affected uh, behavior uh, uh, in a whole wide range of uh, ways, education, and I'll talk about health. Uh, and the second one is uh, focused on fertility. And in the standard model, you can't explain what happened. And the effects are significant. Okay, so that's really the, the, the thrust of the story, that behavior is affected uh, and in a significant way. So the first study was uh, a, uh, that of a uh, exposing people in remote areas, uh, villages of in Oh, do I don't have a time. Okay. Uh, so uh, exposing people to uh, 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 call centers. So call centers uh, for these villages are a good job. And uh, they're performed by uh, uh, young women. And uh, so he, uh, it was done as a a kind of RTC, a random control experiment, sending uh, uh, call center recruiters to 80 villages. And um, uh, went not very often, uh, and they didn't get very many jobs, so it really didn't change the real prosperity. But the fact that the recruiters were there made, changed people's perspective. It made them aware that there were other opportunities than getting married as a young, you know, as a 14 or 15 year old. It gave them the idea that there was an alternative. And the result of that is that uh, you saw a whole uh, 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 variety of, of uh, changes, significant changes in behavior. Uh, the percentage you married during the three-year period uh, went down. Uh, the percentage you had children went down. Uh, um, the desired number of children went down. Uh, uh, the health went up. So uh, these are all dramatic changes that weren't affected by changes in economic circumstances, but really about changes in perceptions, and hard to reconcile with any Bayesian because, uh, theory because it wasn't, uh, it's, it's hard to think about how that could have significantly changed uh, their, their uh, views of, of uh, uh, their life prospects. The next example from Brazil, and a similar example uh, uh, result study was done in, uh, in, uh, in India, uh, makes it even clearer because it was a soap opera, totally fictional. Uh, and it was a really interesting study because it had uh, a good identification strategy. Um, uh, oh, I don't know. Um, so, uh, the, in the soap opera that was shown by this major TV uh, ch uh, channel in Brazil, uh, the typical woman uh, had a, a small family. And uh, uh, you know, all the heroines ha have few or no children. Uh, in contrast, most women in Brazil don't stop bearing children until they have at least five. Um, and yet, uh, the uh, fertility, it had an impact uh, uh, on fertility. Um, hard to explain. Uh, the um, way that it was shown that it had an effect on fertility uh, was that the rollout of the uh, TV station to different parts of Brazil occurred over several years. 
And uh, so this shows the share of municipalities with the access to the station increased uh, gradually over a, a period of time. And the result of that was, if you look at the period right before and right after, you see the exposure to the soap opera had a significant effect in decreasing fertility. And there are many other aspects of the uh, 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 result that were interesting that, that women who were of the age closer to the heroine in the story had a bigger effect. So it was a sense of identification with the, with the person. Uh, but it wasn't as if there was any information because it was all, everybody knew it was all fictional. So it, it, the point of the story is that mind sex can change. And we may not have a full theory about what can cause a change in mindset, but what is very clear is they're endogenous. They're not exogenous. And that's really the, the main thrust of my talk. Well, uh, these are examples of individual behavior, although uh, some aspects like fertility is also socially determined. And there are some experiments now actually, uh, uh, um, some work actually going on in, in Niger using some of these ideas to try to affect uh, fertility rates. So th these ideas are trying to be actually implemented in practice. But where culture becomes really important is in coordination. When people have to interact with each other and you have to form expectations of how other people are going to act and they are forming expectations of you. And that, in that arena, culture is uh, particularly important. Um, and uh, here, um, uh, the, what I call the wrong culture prevents achieving an efficient, coordinated equilibrium. So uh, I'm going to describe a coordination game, a standard coordination game, and some experiments that were done in India uh, about achieving the efficient outcome in the coordination game. Um, uh, uh, the point here is, you know, birds can coordinate when they fly uh, because it's all in their genetic. Uh, we don't have g good genes for coordinating. In fact, we have bad genes uh, for many aspects of cooperative behavior, as, uh, as we've been discovering. Um, so uh, that's why uh, it's uh, uh, a question of, of how people uh, behave. So standard economics had a view that learning to cooperate uh, is mainly a, an information problem. Two individuals re who repeatedly interact, uh, and this is a quote from a study, are almost sure, uh, sure to quickly coordinate on the efficient equilibrium. And um, there have been studies, experiments, that have been done in the United States and other advanced countries showing this. And uh, by the way, this, this uh, next result has a more general moral for anybody who does experimental economics uh, in advanced countries, particularly if they're doing economic students. Uh, it may work there, but may not have universal applicability. So it's a, uh, a standard stag hunt uh, game where you can, uh, the, the idea is you can either hunt together for the stag and uh, if you cooperate and hunt together for the stag you get a big payoff but if you can go individually and hunt for the hare and then you get a little payoff and so uh, the um, uh, this is the 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 payoff matrix which shows that both of them will do better off uh, if they uh, coordinate um, but uh, if they don't coordinate and they both do uh, uh, here, then uh, they get a lower outcome. But if they choose different things, they do even more. One of them does worse. Okay. So uh, as I say, it's a standard uh, coordination game. And uh, the interesting thing about this, uh, the way the experiment was done, was uh, it was done uh, with uh, high caste people playing with high caste people, 
low caste people playing with low caste people and high caste people playing with low caste people. So the question was, what difference did culture make, the culture here being whether you're high caste or low caste, for the ability to achieve the coordinated equilibrium? And uh, you should figure out, the reason I'm telling this story is uh, culture made a difference. <laughs> and uh, you would, uh, uh, could have guessed uh, uh, only the low caste men uh, were able to coordinate and form the efficient uh, convention. Only they were the ones that coordinated on uh, stag stag, okay? And the others uh, didn't, and, and uh, the, uh, the low caste uh, uh, period, did, um, the, the high caste period uh, did very badly, um, and mixed ones did uh, in between. So uh, the question is why does the high caste behavior diverge from the low caste behavior? And uh, the study looked at uh, what, what happened is, the critical point w was when the other party deviated for whatever reason, uh, randomly or, you know, it was interpreted by the high caste people as an insult to their honor. And when you have an insult to the honor, the code of behavior, the culture was you had to punish. And you had to punish for a long time. So that meant that if there was ever a deviation from playing stag, the whole thing broke down. They, it became a manner of honor, even if they had to pay a high price. Uh, honor was more important. And uh, that interpretation was uh, verified by looking at uh, when uh, did the thing break down. Um, after uh, uh, getting a loss from miscoordination, uh, the H people, the high caste people, uh, simply didn't pay, they, they, they played uh, uh, they didn't co cooperate. They didn't play H again. They, they decreased their behavior. And interesting, they, they, uh, looking at people who lived in uh, mud huts as a sign of people who were actually poorer, they were getting actually real money out of this, but honor was even more important for the poor people. Uh, so they were even more punishing than those who were better off. And uh, the study tried to look at uh, control for a whole variety uh, of uh, effects, and it seemed to be uh, robust. And um, uh, there's a literature on uh, differences in caste, uh, and uh, that literature supports the interpretation uh, that I've uh, just uh, given, and in this particular uh, uh, study, uh, the, what what was done is actually looking, talking to these people, and and trying to uh, I'd make sure uh, the, the, that uh, to try to get them to interpret what uh, had gone on, and it became very clear it, to them it was a matter of honor that, uh, and, and so this kind of behavior was verified through a, a set of vignettes uh, uh, and, and very consistent uh, with, uh, um, uh, as I say, the underlying hypothesis. So uh, basically, uh, culture in this case uh, impeded the ability to learn uh, to coordinate because uh, uh, it meant that uh, every time they saw a deviation, it was a threat to their to their honor, and that's how they interpreted. Um, uh, so, the more general point I want to uh, emphasize is that economics leaves out our epistemological resources, the way we see the world. Uh, they think of technology and wealth distribution, but there are also cognitive uh, resources. And we draw upon uh, a limited net set of cognitive resources that are really given 
by our culture. Um, and this then helps us understand a little bit more about societal rigidity and social change. Um, because our lenses are given to us from the past and then are passed on to the future, that me th even if I try to change, I can't change the behavior of other people, the lenses through which other people see the world. So there's this, uh, uh, you might say, the, the, this uh, simple way of thinking about it. Social structures give us, uh, give rise to and are part uh, constituted by our cultural mental models and they influence our perceptions and that again uh, leads to social structures in a uh, persistent uh, way. Um, and that means there are going to be strong links between a society and its historical uh, uh, circumstances. And this is uh, sometimes expressed as social capital, that is to say a set of beliefs and values. Uh, there can be social capital that facilitate cooperation among the members of a community, uh, but there also can be uh, social capital, negative social capital, that interferes with that kind of uh, uh, cooperative uh, behavior. And there are a large number of studies now that have uh, looked at that long-term historical uh, transmission uh, of, of beliefs uh, leading to differences in social capital that have really, really affect uh, uh, behavior. Now, um, in some ways, uh, this is a very uh, pessimistic because it means it's hard to break out of established societal equilibrium. But there may be tipping points where enough individuals are exposed to something that moves their mental model or changes their behavior. Then society can move to a new societal equilibrium. So on the one hand, it's very pessimistic because there's a kind of rigidity. But if you can break into that circle that I described uh, earlier, then you can move things very quickly. And we've seen in our own lifetime some of these big changes on, on a lot of views on uh, various issues, uh, but uh, we've also ha had uh, the consequences of, of uh, uh, cases where it's very, very hard to change. Um, so um, let me try to um, uh, give one more example uh, let me give one more example, a paper that I wrote with Carla Hoff called Equilibrium Fictions, where uh, we begin with a hypothesis that performance affects uh, uh, our beliefs about our self-efficacy affects our performance, our performance affects beliefs, how we perceive performance is affected by preconceptions, that's confirmatory bias. And what we show is that there can, pers uh, can persist equilibrium fictions, where one group, you have two different groups that are inherently identical, but one winds up in a poor equilibrium because everybody thinks it's going to behave more poorly, and because they think it's behaving more poorly, it does behave more poorly. And uh, that can persist, but there can be uh, interventions which change the equilibrium uh, very quickly. So, and th that is part of the argument for, say, affirmative action, where you can change uh, the categories that people are allowed to use to make uh, decisions. So let me just try to, uh, before coming to some of the policy implications, let me try to just summarize, uh, give an overview of the three different models we've talked about. The rational actor with the fixed preferences, uh, objective data-driven information processing, all data is uh, taken into account, and the policy levers are li really limited to incentives, information, and resources. The behavioral economics that has uh, developed over the last uh, 30 years, uh, Kahneman and Tversky, begins with assumptions about stable, deep preferences under slow thinking, um, but uh, under fast thinking, it's very context-driven, and uh, judgments are subject to certain universal heuristics and biases, like anchoring, and here the policy level 
lever is uh, ch trying to change the choice architecture, how people make uh, choices. And one of the big uh, interventions are called nudging. You try to get people to think a little bit more about retirement. And uh, the final column show, uh, tries to describe uh, our quasi-rational enculturated uh, actor where uh, deep preferences change. There's endogenous perception, cognition, and preferences. And that gives a whole set of new policy uh, levers. And I think this perspective provides uh, a, a whole new understanding of uh, societal changes and, and rigidities. Um, and some understanding of some policy successes and failures. For instance, uh, one of the uh, areas of big policy interest uh, of, uh, about 20 years ago was microcredit. And everybody thought microcredit was going to be the solution. And Bangladesh, uh, uh, BRAC, and, and Grameen were extraordinarily successful. And there was a, a movement to globalize it. But when microcredit went to India, uh, it was a big failure. And there had been random control experiments. You know, none of them anticipated the, uh, 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 the, uh, the big failure. Uh, uh, and in fact, uh, I think uh, the rational choice theory provides little insights into what went wrong. Uh, for instance, the peer monitoring uh, work that I did doesn't explain it, nor do the standard models of social capital based on uh, repeated games like uh, those of Tim Bessely and his co-authors. Uh, the best way to understanding it was the difference in the culture of the context of Bangladesh and the way it was done in a for-profit institution in India. So let me just give three examples now of uh, uh, some policy levers uh, that have succeeded in changing mental models. I'm already giving some, like the soap operas, have changed uh, uh, mental models. Uh, and these are three things that uh, uh, have um, actually uh, been uh, 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 used as trying to change behavior. And they're more than nudges. Um, uh, and they are particularly important when dealing with aspects of behavior like fertility that are affected by social norms. Because you're trying to change mindsets about what, uh, what is reasonable behavior. Um, so uh, one is a, uh, a kind of quasi-natural natural experiment where uh, you reduce the social distance between individuals that were in a group and out group. Uh, in, in Delhi, uh, they passed uh, a law, uh, a court order, where uh, the elite private schools had to accept a certain fraction of the students from, of, of poor students. And so now you had the opportunity to uh, see what happened when you had interactions between poor students and rich students. And um, uh, not a surprise, uh, it had a, a very big effect on uh, a whole uh, set of uh, pro-social uh, behaviors. Uh, and particularly less discrimination towards the poor, uh, but Actually, more pro-social behavior uh, as measured by volunteer activity and, and games like the dictator game. So actually, it extended beyond the narrow confines of the example. Uh, the second example uh, was um, uh, a national uh, math competition in Brazil uh, where uh, they looked uh, at what happened when somebody in the student's class uh, got nationally recognized. And again, it was interesting because they had a, 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 an interesting identification strategy because they looked at cases where the student was just recognized or just not recognized. And uh, being recognized had an effect 
on the behavior of the other kids in the class. It shouldn't have, in some sense. It didn't give them any more information, but it did affect their aspirations. And because it affected their aspirations, what they thought they could achieve, it affected behavior in a significant way. And the third example uh, is um, a little bit like uh, the earlier uh, soap opera. Uh, uh, it's a narrative story, but it's based on community-based participatory the theater in West Bang uh, Bengal, um, which was designed to try to reduce domestic violence and the rigidity of uh, patriarchy. And uh, the result of, of the, these interventions is that in the villages with a high exposure to the theater, uh, the uh, vi domestic violence was reduced. And uh, the most interesting aspect was the impact on a household does not, did not depend on whether someone in the household actually watched the performance. So that suggested the, the, the impacts changed the norms of the village. It wasn't the a direct exposure, it was the, the norms of the village that changed. So let me just conclude. This, uh, the quasi-rational and culturated actor opens up a new set of tools for interpreting when we've succeeded in uh, getting social change and explaining why we often have it so difficult to get social change. Uh, it helps us explain some instances of policy successes and failures. And uh, in some key areas, uh, it's a low cost and more effective policy uh, instrument. Um, for instance, we know that tax-based interventions to encourage savings have typically failed. Uh, in fact, you know, most experiments in the United States where we've done that, the cost in terms of uh, reduced t government tax revenue for encouraging people to save more is enormous. Uh, very hard to, to change uh, behavior through incentive effect. Um, but uh, if you can change the norms about savings, you can have a much bigger effect. So, in a lot of the areas where behavior is affected, at least to a significant extent by societal norms, uh, this can, these, these, these interventions can be particularly effective. And these include savings, fertility, education, the role of women. And uh, the social multipliers can amplify the impacts. And just to repeat, the interventions could be on the nudges. Uh, well, I've talked mostly I talked almost exclusively about examples related to developing countries. I want to uh, emphasize that much of what I have to say is also relevant to developed countries. Um, there are very significant consequences, social consequences to inequality. There are lots of research that shows how inequality affects behavior. Uh, and affects social interactions. And it, it may affect savings, uh, indebtedness, uh, entitlement, uh, a whole set of... Uh, so when we come to talk about uh, the consequences of inequality, economists often focus on macroeconomic consequences or uh, the impact of inequality on agency costs. Uh, but there are these broader consequences in terms of uh, uh, the endogeneity of preferences. Um, one of the big issues uh, facing, I think, all the advanced countries have, uh, are, are gender jobs, jobs that are, have been associated with particular genders. And uh, the gendering of jobs, I think, uh, plays a, a large role in unemployment. Uh, in uh, the United States and in many other advanced countries. And obviously it plays a role in social cohesion and conflict. So uh, in conclusion, what I w uh, the social mental lenses through which individuals see the world uh, are, I think, a new topic for economists. Uh, 
When we want to know about spectacles, uh, we train an oculus and expect him to be able to write out the formula for any lens we bring him. Someday, no doubt, we shall recognize that it is the job of the social scientists to do this for the nations of the contemporary world. Ruth Benedict, uh, uh, who was a famous uh, anthropologist uh, taught at Columbia, uh, uh, said that in 1946, and it really uh, is, uh, I think, uh, uh, a framework uh, for economists thinking about this issue. So uh, what I've tried to do is to argue that the quasi-rational actor uh, should be viewed as a special case of the quasi-rational enculturated actor uh, where Preferences are endogenous and affected by culture. It's useful to go beyond the standard model because social patterns shape the lenses, enhance our behavior. They can make dysfunctional social patterns reproduce themselves, and policy can change these lenses. Thank you. <laughs>